Tech Talk. One thirty-five. Let's sign up, boys and girls. Let's go. Look them up. Hey, Charles. Sound check. Six o'clock in Georgia. Five o'clock in Tennessee. Jerry, got some stuff to talk to you guys about. Engines today. Hey, Charlie. Thank you again, Charlie. Theodore, hey, Mr. Bryce, how y'all doing? Sam, good to see you again, Sam, old friend of mine from way back when. Steve, Alan, sounds good. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Alan. Dwayne. Chuck, loud and clear. Thank you, Chuck. Sam, yeah, good to see you, buddy. I know things are cold up there where you live. Hey, Danny, Stephen, I'm... Down here in Tennessee, enjoying the weather and hot rod engines down here. I got some cool stuff to tell you. <laughs> Chris has got an alarm. Thank you, Matt. Steve, yeah, it's great. I mean, you know, if the if you want to see it live, you need an alarm, don't you? I know I do. David, Charles, Chuck, thank you all, man. I appreciate you, too. Yeah, it's great to see. Uh, how about Tech Talk Tuesday? Man, 135 weeks. I'm going to brag about it just for a minute because I know that's somebody looking out for me. Jackie, Julie, good Lord, somebody, because I can't remember 130 any weeks in a row doing anything, man, uh, except for eating, you know, and sleeping and working. Been my whole life. Theodore, Barry, Braun, yep, Arthur. But I don't know, this has been happening so long, and you guys have been watching for so long, and I'm so thankful for you guys checking in. I just want to tell you this, man. They only give us 52 weeks in a year, you know, and this is 135 weeks in a row. We've all gathered up here and talked about engines and hot rods. And and, and if you ever see anything on my board or in my discussion or whatever I'm talking about, a few things are really important. One is these are only my ideas and my opinions. I'm not trying to be right about any of it. I just love to offer my opinion and my ideas about what I think I learned. And there's some ranges here that today is going to be really, really interesting, but in my opinion, because we're going to talk about a little engine and a big engine and differences between them and how they're similar, even though they're very small versus very large. 900 cubic inches in a V8 is a really large engine, large engine in my book. Something with a five inch bore and a five plus five inch stroke is really, really big. Yeah, I know it'd be 156 before you know it. You're right, man. But you know, the the coolest thing that we got going on is uh, when when we were able to run for 10 years, the SNS Pro Stock engine that was a 5.1 bore and a uh, 3.8 crank and able to turn it 10,000 RPM. Uh, that's kind of cool. It was uh, only two cylinders but it made a lot of power. These are the valves out of it. This is a intake valves, 2.75, 2.8, depending on whatever day, and a 208 exhaust valve, maybe a 210 exhaust valve. So these are two of the sample exhaust valves. And this engine, this this big five, hey, Jim, hey, Justin, hey, Brian, Doug, you guys listen, this engine, when it was only a V-twin, it was 160 cubic inches, and it would turn over 10,000 RPM. But what was really neat is if it was a V8, of course, it would be a really big bore space engine. Now they've got some V8s out there for Pro Mod and some really fast cars that has a 5.3 bore space. That's not 5.3 bore. That means how far apart the cylinders are. The center of this cylinder and the center of this cylinder is 5.3. And then you have to have room between them for a cylinder wall. And uh, they got to be able to cool and got to be able to seal the ring. So you have some room in between them. And they could get a 5-inch bore in there. I've heard people run bigger than a 5-inch bore. That only leaves 100 aside for cylinder wall. I believe maybe some people ran some stuff bigger than a 5-inch. But the stroke for those big 900 cubic inch engines and the 1,000 cubic inch engines, the stroke is f over 5 inches, a little less than 6 inches. And the piston is really, really hauling butt. But the one thing that um, that I have been using as sort of a benchmark in my life, my whole career, was when Jackie, and, Jackie Bryce and I, we were teenagers drag racing in 1978. Uh, this this uh, 
we we had always had you know fast Kawasaki's and and stuff, and this was back before the four valve era. We were running Hemi's. Uh, uh, Kawasaki had a Hemi chamber, had an intake valve and an exhaust valve, and it looked just like this. And it was the same design as a Chrysler Hemi, but it had, instead of rock arms, it had double overhead cams. And Honda came out with a CBX. Some of you may have heard of it. I don't, don't do it while we're talking right now. But let's go to, uh, let's look at it, Google it or whatever, Wikipedia or whatever, after our story tonight. But I want you to look at it, some interesting stuff. This is what was really cool to me about it is I always wanted one, but I never really got into a position to have one because it either was irrelevant to my business or it was just kind of like a luxury that I didn't need. Plus I was, I don't know, it was kind of weird. It was just a really wide engine stuck out each side bigger than everybody else's four cylinder and it's six, six cylinders. Now this is what's unique about it. This right here is two, 0.75 inches. Okay, the the piston in the in the um, CBX six cylinder is only two and a half inches in diameter. The piston is two and a half inches, so the piston is smaller than this valve. And there's six of them, of course. And the stroke is 2.1, which is the size of this exhaust valve. This is what the doggone motorcycle looked like. It had three cylinders on each side. It had four camshafts. And I know it's not a Harley. I know it's not pretty any Chevy or Chrysler or whatever. But what's unique about it is, was this back in 1978, 1979. It had four valves per cylinder, double overhead cams. Actually, it had four cams, which I just learned that they have a coupling in the middle. And it had six exhaust pipes. And when you hear one of these drive by at nine or 10,000 RPM with six exhausts at full scream, it sounds like a Ferrari coming or a Porsche with his tail feathers on fire cutaway picture we found so I could show you the six cylinders and the four camshafts 24 valves y'all this little engine has only 62 cubic inches and it came from the factory 44 years ago with a hundred horsepower 61, 62 cubic inches. And listen, listen to this now. This valve, like I said, this valve is 2.1, no, 2.8, sorry, 2.7, 2.7 inches. That's what it, 2.75, I believe it is. Anyway, what I wanted to tell you, really interesting, is the valve in the CBX, one intake valve is one inch. That's half of this exhaust valve. <laughs> I wrote down a couple notes right here that I want to tell you about it. And, and we're going to talk about other engines too, but I just wanted to tell you how amazing this was to me. The intake valve was 25 millimeters, one inch. The exhaust valve is 22 millimeters, that's 0.8 inches. The bore, 64 millimeters, which is 2.5 inches. The stroke is 53 millimeters, which is 2.1 inches. Each cylinder, y'all, the bore and stroke, and the way you do it, if you ever want to do it, is you take the bore times the bore times the stroke times 0 0.7854 times how many cylinders, and it will tell you. But anyway, it was 62 cubic inches. So 6 divided by 6 equals 10 cubic inches. Each little baby cylinder, it has a 2-inch <laughs> stroke and a little 2.5-inch piston in it, and it made 100 horsepower. And they, they are very, very interesting. I mean, that, I, I understand I'm not a big Honda fan, but I got to give an engineer and the engineers that ran these GP engines, they ran 250cc six cylinders. They ran some really strange engines back in the day when they first came out. It developed their Formula One program that has really been leaders in engine technology over the years. And like I said, I'm not trying to be a fan of any one brand, but... If you're an engine guy like me, we love engines, we love RPM, and we love horsepower at output, G-force, and I'll go into G-force here in a minute. Um, found a picture on the internet of a, of a Honda CBX cylinder head, so you could just see. It looks like modern cylinder heads today with four valves. Got, you see over there, it's got four. It's got, uh, it's got two intake valves and two exhaust valves, and this thing will goes from knee to knee when you're sitting on it, 
And one day, y'all, I am going to, I got to go through and work on a couple little things. The brakes need a little work on it. I bought one. Oh my gosh. We bought one. We found a used one right here where we live. And it's um, only has 9,000 miles on it. Found the gentleman that bought it brand new at the dealership in 1978. This thing is 44 years old. And it sounds like an F1 screaming down the straightaway going through the gears. It is very cool. And I'm an engine guy, so I've always loved them. And uh, I'll get to share a little bit more of that with you. But nowadays, you know, in our Harley-Davidson world that, we, that I do for a living or I have done for all these years, and the V twins high performance engines was a 62 cubic inch engine was was a really small little motorcycle engine but this is a small motorcycle engine but it has six cylinders and it revs up so it turns 10,000 rpm the peak horsepower is at 9,000 makes 100 horsepower and that's cool now i mentioned something about acceleration and g-force and i wanted to tell you that i looked this word up today so i could spell it right the accelerometer if you have a data logger or your cell phone, there's accelerometers everywhere. Back back in the day, I see Scott and Brian and Dan and Jimmy, some of the guys watching. Back in the day, an accelerometer was a real luxury, but now they're everywhere in our world, and sometimes we don't even know about them. But we have accelerometers that measure everything that vibrates and moves. And um, I didn't look up the technical side of it, but I want to know. I want you to know how an accelerometer really helped us win a lot of races and hey ricky great to see you on there yeah 124 yeah maybe you could do 200 if you were lucky hey brad but you could do some of this stuff yeah you're right scott but you could do whatever we learned in all these different deals think about this you guys four valves per cylinder 44 years ago peak power at 9,000 rpm yeah this this isn't like i'm not the only person to ever talk about this but i am telling you the engine is phenomenal and it is historic and it has helped fortify why I love this sport so much and why I love this style so much. And it's all about the G-force. Now accelerometer, I read on one, one um, description it said for perfect acceleration or proper acceleration. I'm gonna tell you what, the accelerometers, the G-meters, that's the better word. Accelerometer is the correct technical word for it. It is an accelerometer, but it in reality is a G-meter. It tells us the G-force, and I'm going to tell you something. It tell you, there was one on um, Corvette I had. It was on the, uh, I think everybody that's ever had a chance to ride in one, you can see them. They have a heads-up display, and they had a G-meter right on the windshield. And when you're driving along and you're turning, turning hard, the G meter would go over here, and then when you're turning the left or right, the G meter would go over here. When you give it maximum acceleration, the G meter would move up here. When you jam on the brakes, the G meter would be here. And this little guy, this little dot on the G meter would be running around in here the whole time, turning left, turning right, turning left, hitting the brakes, going fast, getting on the gas, going through the gears, like this, and then hard this way, hard this way. So the G meter was showing us everything based off of zero yeah i know great sound effects right but here is that the drag strip right here this is g-force on this axis this is time on this axis and i don't you know all of us that have ever ridden or driven a really fast car or ridden on a really fast motorcycle or been down the drag strip if you have um go down the track and you go say 100 miles an hour and a quarter mile or 200 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour. But everybody watching this tech talk right here, if you have not been over 100 miles an hour in a car or motorcycle, you have 20 seconds to tell me you have never been over 100 miles, motor, 100 miles an hour on a car or motorcycle. If you've ever been on an airplane, you've been over 100 miles an hour just so you can take off. But listen, when you take off at the starting line and you're going this way, full throttle, your G-meter, well, this is just going to be a real roughy. G-meter goes up and it tapers off at the finish line. If this is zero, G-force, zero G-force. And this is zero time and this is the finish line. How many of you have never been 100 mile an hour? 
Hold your hand up if you haven't ever been over 100 mile an hour car or motorcycle. Come on, let's go. I see you. You guys put your name out there. Come on, give me a thumbs up. It's okay if you've never been over 100 miles an hour, but we're going to help you out if you hadn't. All right, how many of you ever been over 150 mile an hour on a car or a motorcycle? Come on. Everybody give me a thumbs up if you've been over 150 on a car or a motorcycle. Just shoot a little thumbs up. Come on. Let's go. Why y'all laughing? Come on now. This is a real story. We're real men and real women here. There you go. Look at all the thumbs ups. That's good stuff. Good job, y'all. All right. Now, how many of you ha have ever been over 170 miles an hour in a car or a motorcycle? Let's go. New thumbs up. Come on. Let's go. Over 170 miles an hour. This is stretching us out. This is separating us up a little bit. Come on. That's a good crowd. Good for y'all. All right. How many of you ever been 200 miles an hour, over 200 miles an hour, or at least 200 miles an hour? Not that you know somebody or know of a car or a motorcycle, but have personally been over 200 miles an hour. Come on. You're some fast guys. Let's go. And I want you to know everybody on here ain't been 200. Let's do them. Come on. Give me one. Come on. 200 miles an hour. Let's roll. Okay, how many of you on here have been over 250 miles an hour? Not in a quarter mile, but anywhere ever. Car, motorcycle. Come on, let's go. 250. <laughs> I know it narrows us up, doesn't it? 199, that's good. 200 is good. 201. Hey, I'm not saying that any of them is wrong. I'm just saying that everybody, everybody has been 100 miles an hour or better. But not everybody has been over 200 miles an hour. I'm just saying that's that's really, really separates them a little bit. And yeah, I understand. I might have been over 200 before. I think I did in Frank Hawley's Funny Car back a long time ago. I think I went over 200 one time. And, and I've been over 200 on a couple really fast motorcycles in my life. And I've been 190-something in a pro stock car a few times, pro mod car a few times. Uh but now I'm 67 years old, and I have I don't have any desire to go 200 miles an hour anymore. I really don't. But what I do want to do is I want this. I want this. I want this G-Force right here. I love G-Force. I love 2Gs, 3Gs. I love 4Gs. I love 5Gs. And I'm not talking about your cell phone service either. I'm talking about how many times your body's weight multiplied with g-force now i drew this graph to explain to you guys that when you ha when you launch from a dead stop you get the most acceleration very soon and your acceleration rate tapers to the finish line if i told you this was a top fuel car graph you would say yeah but they go 330 miles an hour and 1000 feet yes they do but when they get to the finish line, they are almost out of G-force. They might have one, maybe two Gs at the finish line, but they got four, maybe more at when they launch, the first few feet. They have to go, the, the acceleration rate is the highest when you're going the slowest because you're going from nothing to something, and the G-force goes well, I know, right? Cell phone, cell phone. Yep, you got 4G, 5G. Acceleration is very addictive. G-force in the dragster is the same. That's exactly right. It looks just like this. Pro stock motorcycle G-force should look like that. Top fuel should look like that. Pro stock car should look like that. But let me give you a couple, couple things that are interesting about the pro stock car or the pro stock motorcycle. On pro stock car, they have five gears, so they have they have a lot of G-force, and then they have a shift. And then they have a shift, and then they have a shift, and then they have a shift. So they got one, two, three, four, five gears. I'm going to change it up a little bit because of the pro stock car. Looks, they get all the gears early. They go, they go second, third, fourth, fifth, and then they just wind it out. So when they get to half track, they're just into high gear almost. So they go, they use, they use all their gears to get their G, to get the most G's early. They get the most G-force early. And once they get it up to, oh, what do you go, 160, 170 miles an hour in the eighth, 
by half track, they only go 210 in the quarter. So they pick up another, what is that, uh, 30, 40, pick up about 45 mile an hour. Some of them go 165 in the eighth. Talking about a pro stock car, 500 cubic inch. Pro stock motorcycles, I know a lot about this one because I did it for almost my whole life. When I had the, one of the first G meters ever, when Race Pack came out with one that us mortals could buy and use on our vehicles, when he had the uh, Race Pack data logger, we would be at zero G force. We would accelerate to three Gs, ride along as high as we could in first, shift to second, shift to third, shift to fourth shift to fifth, shift to sixth, and then ride it out to the finish line. And it would be somewhere around 2.8 to 3 Gs in low gear and maybe 0.5 at the finish line. Now, if you're going 60 miles an hour with a 2.8 Gs or 3 Gs at 60 miles an hour, this thing is peeling your face back. I mean, it is literally stretched your arms out. It's, it's making your – it's just – Feels like it's pulling like crazy, but it's only going 60 miles an hour. At the finish line, when it's going 200 or 195 miles an hour, you only have 0.5, a half a G. People think that when you're going at the finish line, they think that you're going, you're accelerating the hardest here. You're making the most time, but you're not accelerating very hard. You're almost out of G-force. Matter of fact, if I was racing today and they would let me, I would have a seven speed and I would crowd these gears in and I'd have a little bit more g-force here and a little bit more here and a little bit more here and a little and I'd run out at the finish line because I would want to go I would like to have the highest amount of g-force the longest time and be finished accelerating when I get to the finish line that's kind of my goal g-force is very addictive now we use an accelerometer to measure the g-force and to read it and it is i'm going to try and say it right a piezoelectric sensor where it takes some measurement and converts it into another measurement so we can read it and the race pack accelerometer g meter was a zero to five volt output so we could see how many volts we had in low gear or second year or third year now i'm going to get a i'm going to stretch this out a little bit and talk about something that's not very often spoken and these, like I said, you guys, these are my opinions, so please take it for what it's worth. Your dyno, I'm going to move this out here a little bit in the middle of the board. Your dynamometer tells you how much power your engine has. So your dyno curve may look like this. And this is power this way. And RPM this way. This is how our dyno sheets look. Peak power is here. And most of us that get dyno work done, this is how our dyno sheet looks. They usually cut it off right about here. We go up into a peak power and then they shut it off. And at the racetrack, when you're trying to go fast or set records or win races or outrun your buddies out there illegally, outrunning folks, you don't shift here. And I've told you this before, but I'm going to explain it in a different way today. You don't shift here. You shift past here to where when you fall back to the next gear, you come back before here, go past here, fall back before here, go past here, fall back to before here. And when I say before here and past here, here is peak power. Peak power. Not peak torque, not peak RPM, but peak power. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. Whatever your gear drop is, like if your engine drop, if your transmission drops 2,000, when you shift it drops back 2,000, you want to go about 1,000 past peak, come back under about 1,000. Go about 1,000 past peak, come back under for about 1,000. So you get this area under the curve where you have the most power for the most amount of time. And this chart doesn't show time. This chart shows power and RPM. The accelerometer at the track shows how hard it's pulling versus how long. So we take this information and we convert it over to the, the accelerometer and the G-meter. And this now is time. And this is how hard it's pulling, which I'm going to call G-force. And you all see this and understand and hear me okay? Everybody got me? All right. Let's go. 
when you go through your gear, let's just say you do a fourth gear roll on and remember the dyno sheet, remember how it looked, it had like this little curve, okay? Right here in that gear is where you should have the most G-force. So you're coming through the gears and you're in first, second, third, fourth. Let's say you're in fourth gear. When you are pulling in fourth gear, and let's say this is uh, zero Gs, you're pull, you're pull harder, it's pulling harder, it's pulling harder, it's pulling harder. And when you get to peak, then the G-meter noses over. And when it gets back, when the G-force is falling, this is when you're riding the motorcycle and you're going along at full throttle or you're in a car and you've got it floored and you're watching the tack go and it goes, ah, and just doesn't want to go anymore. Your G-meter is tanking. Your G-meter is falling over. You don't have one to look at. You don't know exactly what I'm saying, but... If you had, people say, I got a G-meter in my butt. I know where to shift just because I can tell the way it's pulling. My G-meter's pull, my, I can feel the acceleration and it's pulling hard. And when I feel it nose over, I shift to the next gear. Well, if you were racing for a living and you were trying to go the quickest ET you could, you would study this G-meter because when you're going down the track, it says first gear pulling hard, then it falls over, then shift to second. Second gear is pulling hard, then it falls falls over, then shift to third. It's, it's pulling hard, it, over, it falls over, then you shift to the next gear, and it's pulling hard. And, and then when you get through with this, it ends up looking kind of like a real smooth curve, but it has highs and lows. If you over rev low gear, let's say you go and hit the rev limiter, the G meter's pulling, 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 and then when you hit the rev limiter, the G meter falls like this. I mean, it nearly... I mean, it, it will put your head into the steering wheel. It will put your head into the windscreen. It will put your head into the handlebars. And then you shift to the next gear, and it jumps right back up because it says thank you. But second gear now is so short because you use so much time deceling in the over-revved low gear that second gear falls off quick. Now you're in the limiter again. Now it falls over again. So you end up with a seesaw that at the end of the day, it is a slow ET and it will have a low MPH because you spent this much time deaccelerating. You spent this much time deaccelerating. Remember, this side is time. So when you are deaccelerating in the rev limiter, you are wasting time, and it shows up on your time slip, and it shows up on your mile an hour. <laughs> I know that's got to be crazy. When you when you get the um, when you short shift, that's like you're climbing, climbing, climbing in G force, and then you shift to the next gear and it pulls harder. And then you short shift, and then you shift to the next gear and it pulls harder. The G meter is not showing you how high you're going. You're it's showing you. The G meter doesn't show you the greatest of everything. It shows you the reality. It shows you if you over revved or under revved or you use it just right. And each gear, I tell people at the drag strip all the time, I said, I said, use the full dyno sheet. <laughs> In each gear. In other words, you got a dyno sheet somewhere in your back pocket. It's in the bags, it's in the trunk, it's in the glove box, it's in the console. You got a dyno sheet, and it shows you the power curve. You need to use that in every gear in order for you to get to the finish line first. If you do, if you use the full dyno curve in each gear, you will have the most mile an hour at the finish line, and you will be in front of the other guy. If you're or girl, if you're short shifting, you're leaving horsepower on the table. If you're over revving and you're wasting time over revving, you're also almost skipping gears. Think about it. If you only have 10 seconds to go through five gears, if you only have 10 seconds, and you spend one-tenth over revved in low, you spend two-tenths over revved in second, and you spend three-tenths over revved in third, then you finally get your act together for fourth gear or fifth gear, you have just wasted all that time. Instead of going a 10-0, you might only go a 10-50. And then... The guy that built your motorcycle or your engine for you or your car said it was a 10-0 machine and he only, you only won a 1050. Now you're mad at him. You're mad at the guy over here that built it instead of the guy doing the driving. <laughs>
I know that's kind of hard to swallow sometimes, but that's part of the G meter, the accelerator, the G, uh, the dyno sheet. You get to use each the power in every gear and the G and the gear gear ratios because we have a G meter that goes less the further down the track we go. Our ratios have have um, the transmission ratios need to have like a 30% drop on the one two, 22%. And then maybe an 18 percent and then maybe a 14 percent and so on and so on and so on because when you're going only 60 miles an hour the wind is not blowing on you or your car or your motorcycle as much and you can stand to drop 30 percent in rpm from first to second then you need to stay closer to the cam closer to the pipe when people say get get it up on the pipe and keep it on the pipe, your shift points do that. Your how far you go in each gear does that. So you need to stay on the pipe. You need to stay on the cam because the pipe is the wrong size anywhere but the right time, and the cam's the wrong size anywhere but at the right RPM. And if you can stay, the G meter will help you see how long you were on peak G's, and you have the chance to get the quickest ET. Another thing, last thing that I wanted to try and remember to tell you about is um, people with G-meter in their butt, they think they have that, but they're listening. If you, get, if you took away the sound, that would be a real challenge because people hear the noise and think they're, some guys are good at it, but they've been doing it a long time. They feel it. I listen to the engine. I hear the engine playing when I drive Buck or or Bagzilla or any of those fast bikes I had in my day, you know, Kawasaki, Suzuki's, Hondas, whatever, I could I can tell it's accelerating, it's gaining in RPM, and as soon as it quits gaining, it's time to go to the next gear. And if you shift too soon, it slows down. If you shift too late, it slows down. It takes up time. And I just took up all mine, and I took up all yours. I wanted to say thank you all very much for tuning in for Tech Talk number 135. It's been great sharing this time with you guys again. And uh, please come back next week and watch 136. And uh, everybody, we're going through tough times in the world, man. Let's pray for each other, look after each other. Uh, we, we are very lucky and very fortunate to be looking at Tech Talk Tuesday on this Tuesday evening while some people are struggling for their life. May God bless you all and look after each other. Good night.